Hey, this is Stefan from the Great World History Book, and in this lecture I will present to you the Great Mysterious Megaliths. So what exactly are megaliths? Megaliths are the mysterious prehistoric structures made from just one or a couple of very, very large and heavy stones. The most famous example is of course Stonehenge from around 2500 BC, and we'll talk a lot about Stonehenge later. But first, let's look at the very beginning. Until recently, it was believed that megalithic structures first appeared in Europe about 6000 BC. But recently, a site in Turkey known as Gobekli Tepe was discovered that pushes the time back centuries, millennia even. The site was established around approximately 10,000 BC, shortly after the end of the last ice age, and it reached its peak around 9,000, 8,000 BC. The site includes a large number of circular rooms with T-shaped pillars in the middle and some smaller pillars on the side. Some of these pillars are an impressive six meters tall. We see some images in a moment. Hundreds of people must have been involved in the construction of this site. And since no settlements were found nearby, the place likely had some kind of ceremonial function. People went there for some cultural reason. So here we see an image from the archaeological site of Gobekli Tepe. On the left, you see those large T-shaped pillars. On some of the pillars, we find sophisticated carvings. And this is one of the most impressive one of some kind of lizard carved out of the rock. And here we have an impressive totem pole. Imagine this could be 10,000, 9,000 BC, an incredible long time ago. Starting around 6000 BC, various farming communities in Western Europe also began to build grand megalithic structures made out of these enormous stones dragged over enormous distances. Europe alone counts over 35,000 megaliths. The purple shading on this map shows where most of them are located, so in Western Europe mostly. The simplest of these megaliths consist of single vertically placed stones, sometimes by themselves or sometimes multiple of these vertical stones placed in rows or in circles. Here we see a very famous example from Portugal. A more advanced structure was the so-called dolmen, which consists of a capstone placed horizontally on top of two or more standing stones. Here we see an example from Ireland from the 4th millennium BC and an example from Wales from about the same time. Now looking at these strange mysterious structures and thinking how can such as a large heavy object have been lifted on top of these standing stones, it isn't surprising that for centuries people have come up with the most crazy conspiracy theories on how they must have been constructed. Nowadays, of course, the story is they must have been constructed by aliens because no human beings without advanced technology of today could have made these structures. But even in the past, uh, there were lots of conspiracies. For instance, in the Middle Ages, here we see Merlin instructing a giant on how to place the capstones on top of Stonehenge. Although the movements of these heavy rock without rocks without modern machinery might seem like an impossible feat, it has been replicated various times by just using simple levers, just pillars of wood. Here we see an example of a megalith built today. So there's evidence that it's possible to do so today. This is an example from Indonesia. So how is it possible? Let's go to some of the details. There are many ways, but this is one possibility. A large block can be lifted by using multiple levers on either side. You can dig a few holes, stick a number of these levers in, and then you can move the rock forward by moving these levers like an oar of a boat. So you push them down and back, and then you move that large rock incrementally forward. Well, this takes a lot of manpower and a lot of time, but it's definitely possible. So this is how to move one of those rocks, but how do you lift them? Well, sort of the same process. Now you again stick those pillars in, you push them downwards, lifting the rock a tiny bit, and then you immediately place a log underneath it. And then you have lifted the rock by a tiny bit and you repeat the process over and over again, lifting it each time a tiny bit. 
And we see this happening on this screenshot over here. This is exactly, we see the pillars on the side, those are the levers, and we see the logs placed underneath. Another method that we know has been used in the past is as follows. You can cover the standing stones by a hill and then drag the capstone on top and then remove the hill again. This is another way to do it. Now let's look at an even more sophisticated structure. In some places, a whole range of dolmen were stacked next to each other in order to form a tunnel. And this tunnel was then covered with a hill. And we call this structure passage graves. Here we see an example of a passage grave from Wales. In some of these passage graves, we have found skeletons, pottery, weapons, tools, and various other objects. It is very likely, therefore, that these sites were burials and that those objects were given to the dead to be used in the afterlife, as is a common belief across the world. Here we have the most famous passage grave, the Newgrange Passage Grave from Ireland from about 3200 BC. A beautiful structure, but I do have to disappoint you that the wall surrounding it is a modern invention. I believe that in the 60s or so, there was an archeologist. He found lots of pebbles on the side, believed they were part of a wall, and he arranged for a concrete wall to be made and placed those pebbles inside it. Uh, but later on, it was discovered that with just pebbles, without concrete, it's not possible to build a wall that steep. So that probably wasn't how those pebbles were used in their original state. So that's a bit of a scam. But anyway, it's a beautiful structure nonetheless. So let's uh, discuss it further. The passageway inside Newgrange is always covered in darkness and shadow, but with one exception. On midwinter morning, the shortest day of the year, sunlight shines through an opening above the entrance, lighting up the 19 meter long passageway for approximately 20 minutes, and then it goes dark again for the whole year. Here we see a cross section. You see the light shining through the opening, just above the entrance, shining inside the passage. And here we see the actual event happening, just 20 minutes each year. This discovery tells us that the makers of Newgrange had knowledge of the changing orbit of the sun, which required systematic observations of the night sky. It is the oldest undisputed evidence of ancient astronomy. So why did they do all this? Well, midwinter day must have had a specifically significant meaning to these farmers, as it marks the point after which the sun gains in strength, creating warmer and longer days, which would eventually cause the growth of vegetation, which is of course important for farmers. Here we see the entrance, by the way. Um, you see the hole above the entrance. Of course, the wall you have to block out of your mind because that's a modern invention, but you do have that large stone in front of the entrance with uh, strange spiral carvings on it, which is part of the original. Here we see a kind of stone bowl in the middle, straight in the middle of the passage grave, possibly a place where offerings were made. And above this uh, bowl, we see stacked stones moved up vertically and on top of it, a ceiling, which is unique to, to Newgrange. Now let's move to Stonehenge. One of the most remarkable and unique of the megalithic structures is of course Stonehenge. It was built around 2500 BC and took an estimated 200 years to complete. The monument consists of two types of stone, larger stones taken from a source nearby, still an impressive feat to move those large stones, of course, but there are also smaller stones, which are still quite heavy, that were taken from a source some 250 kilometers away. Here we see a modern image from Stonehenge. You see the, a circle of larger stones surrounding it. You see a circle of larger stones in the middle. And then between those two circles, you have those smaller stones. Can be easier seen in this reconstruction. Also notice that the outer circle used to be one complete circle. Uh, only a small part of that circle has remained at this point, of course. Here we see how the capstones of Stonehenge are attached to the standing stones. They use a Lego-like structure. There are knobs on top of these stones. And on the right, you see an image where you see one of those knobs. Some of the stones had one knob, some had two, as in the drawing. 
Unlike the Passage Grave, there is no evidence that this place, Stonehenge, was used as a burial site. Instead, it has been identified as a place of worship since number, a number of pits were found around Stonehenge that were used for offerings. The ancient Greek writer Diodorus from about the 1st century BC called Stonehenge an, a, temple, a temple to Apollo, indicating the connection of the place to sun worship, which might have been the original purpose. This theory is supported by the fact that sunlight shines through the main entrance on midsummer morning. Geoffrey of Monmouth, a medieval chronicler, wrote that Stonehenge was used as a place of healing. People were reported to pour water over the small stones and then wash themselves with it, hoping to get cured of their illnesses. However, this was thousands of years after the creation of the original site, and it might not have been the original purpose, but this is what we know about it. Finally, we'll take a look at the megalithic structures of Malta. Around 3200 BC, an underground tomb called the Hypogeum was built on the island of Malta, which served as a burial site for about 7,000 people. It is known for its especially impressive architecture, which we'll see in the next image. Incredible, it's the only example of this kind of sophisticated architecture that we have from that time period. Totally marvelous. Not far from the Hypogeum, we have found impressive stone temples as well. In one of them, we found a number of altars on which animals were sacrificed and the remains of a large statue of a goddess figure. Only the lower part has remained at this point. Here we see one of the temples seen from above. And this is the other temple. And here we see uh, the goddess figure. It must have been a very large statue, of course. And here, finally, we see some sophisticated carvings of animals from the same site. So, I hope you find this lesson interesting. If you want to know more, much more detail, much more examples, go and read the Great World History Book. At this point, you can order it only through worldhistorybook.com. Hope you enjoyed it. See you soon. Bye.